Well, hello everyone. I'm really happy to introduce you to Peter Jacobson of Total Vocal Freedom. Great. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the Alexander Technique. So Peter, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background so that we can get to know you a little bit. Yeah, thanks Karen. It's really great to be here. I, um, I, uh, I know you a little bit. We, we met in person in, in uh, Las Vegas last summer and really uh, admire the work that you're doing in helping, to sing, helping singers um, be more expressive and find, find their freedom. And that's what I'm all about too. Um, I'm a lifelong musician. I started playing piano when I was five, um, been singing my whole life, uh, percussion, guitar, um, I taught instrumental music for a while, and now I exclusively work with singers. Um, I have a background in music education and conducting. I have uh, degrees from Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, um, University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, and uh, the Peabody Institute. Um, so I love learning. And um, I also have um, a, a certification in the Alexander Technique, which is a three-year, 1,600-hour certification program. It's quite intense. Um, and for the past five years, I've been helping singers um, find more freedom in their bodies and their voices and in their minds through the Alexander Technique. Excellent. So today we're just going to talk a little bit about the Alexander Technique, and uh, we're going to talk about some perhaps practical ways that we can apply this to our own singing, at least the concepts. So um, let's start off with talking about what the Alexander Technique is and perhaps what it's not, because I think sometimes we have misconceptions about what it is yes. when we're not actually practicing it and, and taking lessons. Yeah, I, I'm so glad you said what it's not <laughs> because a lot of people that have learned about the Alexander Technique, they have an idea that it's getting in and out of a chair and lying on a table. And that's certainly one way that you can learn the Alexander Technique. In fact, that was pretty much how Alexander taught it himself. But what I prefer is to actually use Alexander Technique in the activity of singing or really whatever it is that, that a student wants to explore, but more often than not, it's singing. But we have done, um, we have done walking lessons. We've done lessons while typing at a computer. Um, I just taught a lesson yesterday about going up and down stairs. Um, and my philosophy is that anything that we do in our daily life to feel more ease in our body will help our singing. So it kind of doesn't matter what, what we do so much. Um, so I just wanted to say that up front in case anybody's had an experience with the Alexander Technique and they only think it's those things. It's those things and it's much more. Um, for me, it's the practical application um, in my daily life about the things I care about that is actually how I like to use the Alexander Technique. Um, so... Alexander was a really interesting guy. I'm not going to tell you too much about him. You can read about his story online, but he was an actor that had a voice problem. Um, and he, he figured out um, that he was doing some things to his body that really weren't helping him. Um, and the three main things he was doing was he was gasping for breath. He was depressing his larynx and he was pulling his head down into his body when he'd go to, to speak as an actor. And he discovered that I can't, he, he, he did some experiments and he discovered, I can't really um, exert much control over the breathing. I can't exert much control over the larynx, but I can exert a lot of control on what my head does. And so he discovered, and you can all do this as you're watching this, if you just think of your head just going in an upward direction and your whole body following, it can make you feel lighter and everything becomes easier. And really, um, that's basically the Alexander Technique. There's, you know, there's more facets to it, but at the core, it's really talking about this relationship of the head to the spine and, and whether or not we're stiff and tight in that relationship or whether we have this sort of dynamic freedom um, between what's happening in the head and the spine. And uh, can I share something practical, Karen, that I think? Of course. Okay, great. So one of the things I like to do is if you make a fist with your hand, uh, with one hand, and then if you put two fingers together, so this is a head and this is the body, okay? So if you put the head on your body, right, and you just kind of take it for a little walk. I know it's silly, but just go with me. <laughs> and now if you pull your head down into your body, 
you can feel how tight your body gets and it's just harder to move right now just stop doing that just let your head move away from your body and you notice how easy it is in your body now and that's the basic idea in our body now i want to do another experiment that kind of demonstrates um, how people can take this too far and we'll let's use our other hand we'll make a fist and if we squeeze our fist really tight i can feel that there's a lot of tension like we wouldn't want to sing like that with a lot of tension in our body okay now what a lot of people do is they notice that there's tension and they do this boom and they go the opposite direction and try to overcorrect. but actually the opposite of this isn't this the opposite of this is an unfolding and a not squeezing and not tightening. And then the natural shape, the natural thing does itself without us really having to do much. And so a lot of the Alexander technique is built on just trusting what your body naturally wants to do if you get out of the way. It's not about micromanaging or trying to control this muscle or that muscle. Um, it's like, if I just understand that my body is designed such that if, I, if my head moves in an upward direction and everything kind of follows and releases and expands, then, then that, that's enough, right? I don't have to do a whole lot more than that. Um, so those are two kinds of things that I like to show people like very practically. Um, another thing you can do, we can play around with is actually go into a little scrunch. You know, you, it's called this the scrunch where you scrunch up and even a subtle scrunch can, can make a big difference. And then you can try singing and just notice it doesn't feel very good. And then unscrunch and let your head move away from your body. Let your body follow. And even now I can feel and hear a difference in my voice. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's great. Yeah, I feel like um, so many of us, not just singers, <laughs> just people in general, we have a lot of holding tensions and a lot of inessential tensions that we apply to everything that we do. I'm one of those people. I'm one of those you know, I'm just always holding so much and everything that I do is just overdone <laughs> in yes. terms of the, the amount of effort and muscle that I apply to things. I catch myself doing that all the time. And yeah, I find in singing because I have all sorts of, you know, issues with my cervical spine and just feeling that sense of lifting away is just, it gives you that sense of buoyancy and that it, it's just amazing what a small shift can, can do. Yes, exactly. And I'd like to speak to that because a lot of um, people, again, when they're, when they're exploring this for the first time, they think they're looking for the right position. And it's, it's actually not true. The way this whole head spine system is designed is for there to be constant movement and adjustments happening all the time. So it's not like, okay, I got up, I got my Alexander position. It's like, no, I'm just thinking up and I'm thinking dynamic and flow and space and availability of movement. That's one of the things I love to say, that there's always movement available. And like you said, if we're tight and we're stiff and we're held really rigid, we don't have that availability for movement when our body needs it to sing, to sing a hard, difficult passage or a high note or, or something that's more challenging. So I, I love this idea that um, Pedro de Alcantara, he, he wrote a wonderful book called um, Indirect Procedures, which is kind of the, um, the musician's Bible for the Alexander technique. And he talks about latent mobility, that latent within our system is always waiting kind of in the wings is movement available if we want it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I've emphasized this before in previous videos that posture, I usually talk about it more in terms of body alignment, but posture is not a pose. It's not a pose that we strike, it's a dynamic, flexible thing. And our bodies move in and out of these positions of optimal mechanical advantage. And the idea is that, you know, that we're always trying to achieve a degree of efficiency, but that not every position that we're in is going to be the most efficient per se, but that we want to encourage as much efficiency as possible yes. as we're, as we're moving, but it's not a pose. And I think it's that, you know, we, we've, we've read this, I'm sure many times that, you know, we talk about posture, and everybody just wants to assume like a military pose, right? That stance where you're just very stiff and your chest is up high and your back's arched and, and that's not good body alignment and that's not flexible and that's not gonna help us in singing. 
Yes, exactly. And and I, I want to speak to that because this is this is one of the places I start when I work with a new student is this idea of support and mobility. And there's an, a really famous Alexander te Technique teacher, her name is Barbara Conable. And she says that singing is movement, pure and simple, nothing else, right? We Singing is movement. So if we're held stiff like that, things can't move. Now, that being said, everything doesn't move when we're singing, right? We need some sense of support. Otherwise, it's just kind of loosey-goosey. There needs to be support. And so one of the places that I think is really fascinating to explore is to go as far away from the voice as we can to our feet. And if, we, if we're standing when we sing, the feet are actually the platform of our whole body, right? So we need to feel the support of the ground beneath us in order so the system can feel secure enough to allow for that movement. Because one of the strongest fears in human beings is the fear of falling. And our system, no, it will find a way no matter what, right? And so if we're, not, if we're not really sure where we're supported in our body, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but if we're not sure, then we're gonna use um, what you might call the wrong muscles to hold us up and feel safe and secure. And I'll explain it in two different ways. There, there are basically two kinds of muscles in our body. There are what are called the being muscles, and they're for support and for security and for posture, if you want to use that term. Um, and then there are the doing muscles, which, which provide motion and mobility. Now, a lot of people, because they don't really understand how the system works, they're actually using the doing muscles, the external muscles, they're, they tend to be more superficial, to hold themselves upright. And the, and the problem with that is that the doing muscles get tired very easily. and They're not designed for that purpose. And so we get pain, we get back pain, we get a neck pain, we get some sort of pain because that's your pain is your system telling you, hey, this isn't quite how we're designed to work. So it's, it's like a, on your dashboard, change oil. It's just like a, a warning sign, right? But if you understand that your support comes from the center of you, that your spine um, and your bones are actually deep in the center of you. And next to those um, bones are the being muscles, the intrinsic muscles. And the cool thing is they never get tired. They, like, they are like, that's their superpower is they never get tired. So if you, you can play around with, um, as you're standing, just shifting where you are thinking of your balance and your support coming from. It, like if you think of it's coming from the back of your back, then you'll lean back and then you'll have to grip and tighten. Um, I'll give you an example. It's working with the singer last week and she said, Oh, it's just, it's just really tight here, really tight. And as I looked at her, I saw that she was leaned back. Well, the tricky thing is she didn't think she was leaning back. She thought she was straight up and down. <laughs> and so I just kind of helped her find her balance. And she's like, that feels so far forward. But the rest of the group, there's 20 other people and they're like, nope, it's not. And then this went away. It was the craziest thing. And it all had to do with how she was um, organizing herself in terms of her, her balance and her support. So that can be a, a really important starting place if you're having like even tension right here, just to look at how am I balancing? How am I supporting myself? Another image that we like to use is... Um, if you've ever seen a, a long peacock feather, what you can do is you can actually balance the peacock feather on your palm, and you'll notice it's always kind of moving. And this is an analogy I like to use for human balance, that we're not, again, we're not trying to find that position. If you actually just stand and close your eyes, you'll notice that your body is constantly wanting to adjust and to shift and to move. It's like, a skyscraper isn't designed to be perfectly still. It's designed to sway. And there's actually strength in that. So balance, I actually like to think of it as balancing, that it's a verb, it's something I'm doing, not a thing I need to find. It's not like, okay, I got my balance. No, I'm balancing, I'm supporting in my center, and then things that move can, things that want to move can move. Good. Yeah, the flexibility is great. And you, you spoke about the feet and, um, you know, just sort of being that 
support structure for us. And I always talk about achieving both this feeling of buoyancy, that feeling of lightness, but the feeling of stability yes. at the same time. And that's, I think, really important for singers is that we, we're not stiff and holding, but we also don't feel that sense of losing balance. Yes. Yes, exactly. It's, I always think of it as like a dance kind of between, um, like you said, buoyancy and stability, between um, mobility and support, whatever terms you want to use. It's, it's this like dynamic interplay. Right. So one of the other questions that we were talking about answering, and you've kind of touched on this a little bit, is, you know, what does Alexander Technique have to do with my singing? <laughs> like, what does it have to do with it? And you've, yeah. Is there anything else that you feel like you want to kind of touch upon in yeah. terms of how it actually works with singing? Yeah. Well, I think, I think intuitively every singer knows this, that your, your singing is more than just your voice box. It's more than just your larynx, right? Th this is just a very small part of you. Of course, this is where the vibrations are made and the sound is made, but this is part of a larger structure and that's your human instrument. It's, it's all of you, right? And, and, you know, just as an example, I'll share two really interesting anat anatomical features about human beings that just show how we're so interconnected. There's a muscle called the omohyoid muscle, which actually goes from your shoulder blade all the way up to your hyoid bone, which is where your voice hangs from. And it's like, who thought of that? That's a really interesting design, but that's how we're designed. And so there's like a direct connection between shoulder and larynx. And if, you, if you're depressing your shoulders, that's gonna exert, exert pressure or pull on that whole system. So that's just one example. Um, another example is there is, um, it's called the front line. And I don't exactly know um, like what it's made of, but basically there is a direct connection from your toes all the way up the front of you, through the inside of you, through your diaphragm, all the way up to the base of your tongue, which is your hyoid bone. So it's like, there's a connection between toes. <laughs> so really we're looking at, we're looking holistically at the whole system. And um, I'll share a, uh, a definition of the Alexander Technique, which I like so much from one of my teachers, Kathy Madden. She says, the Alexander Technique teaches us the magic of how we're made. And when we know how we're made, everything becomes easier. When we, ha when we innocently misunderstand how we're engineered and put together, that's when we get into trouble with tension and pain and, and all sorts of things. So, I think one of the most important things that any singer can do is really invest yourself in studying how you're put together. How, how would this all work, right? Where are the major bones and joints? I mean, there's like 600 muscles. You don't need to learn all those, but just kind of have a general understanding of, of how this human system works. Because this is a kind of a crazy thing about um, how humans work, that we don't actually move or sing with the body we have we move or sing with the body we think we have and if we have ideas about our body that are not anatomically true that's where we again where we get into trouble so we call this understanding the design and then cooperating with the design Yes. And I know it's also often referred to as mapping or correctly mapping your body is being able exactly. to you know see where things connect and where they go to. And I think sometimes it's one of those things for singers because we think of singing as being this art and we think of anatomy and physiology as being a science and, and almost as though they can't, or they shouldn't have any kind of connection with each other in some ways. Yeah. And so I think that there's sometimes this reluctance to really study that and to really understand how our bodies are working. But we do have to understand that our bodies are our instruments our whole bodies. And um, there's also, and I, I speak of this a lot, this idea that we experience these localized tensions and pain. And we often feel like that is the source of the, the problem. And that's what we should be focusing on is that particular area, larynx, neck, tongue, whatever it might be. But, you know, you've mentioned it too, that it's this whole systemic thing. We have to kind of sometimes, you know, trace things down to the root. Where is that imbalance? 
And it's those imbalances that lead to things that have that sort of trickle effect, that snowball effect going out. And it could be it from all the way down to your toes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the, and that's the crazy thing is it's you, you just don't know. And and one of the things that I'm constantly asking my students because I I want to get a a glimpse into their understanding of their design is you know I'll, I'll often ask them if they they point to a problem area. Um, what's your understanding or your idea of that area? So I'll just give you a really practical example. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the arms because the more I do this, the more I realize that people have weird ideas about their arms. And it really influences how they sing because of where the arms are in relationship to this and the breathing system. So I was working with, a, 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 we had a retreat last week. And so I was working with a lot of singers and, and I asked um, the gentleman, you know, what's your idea of your arm? And where does it att attach to your torso? And he, he pointed to here, like most people do, because we grew up playing with Barbie dolls and G.I. Joes. And, you know, this is where we see that it's attached. Well, the truth of the, the structure is that it actually is attached here at the sternum, that our clavicle and our scapula are actually part of our, our entire arm structure. And later on, I was working with another student that couldn't, couldn't get her arm above like this. So I showed her that she could include her scapula and clavicle in the movement. And then like magically, all of a sudden, boom, she could lift her arm all the way up. And she was told by her doctor that she needs to go to six months of physiotherapy to fix her shoulder problem. She didn't have a shoulder problem. She had an idea about her shoulder that was not true. <laughs> and once we changed the idea, we just replaced the idea, boom, magic. <laughs> but it wasn't magic, right? It seems like magic, but all we're doing is aligning our idea with nature. And when we do that, we get freedom. I was trying to pull up a picture of the, um, so when we were in NATS at the National, the conference for the National Association of Teachers of Singing in Vegas, that's what we were doing there, we weren't gambling. Um, <laughs> um, I, don't know, I don't know what you did in your spare time, but I wasn't gambling. <laughs> I was not gambling. <laughs> Um, I had the privilege of watching you work with one of our colleagues just for a few minutes. And um, I posted this on, I was trying to look it up on Facebook. I wasn't ignoring you there. Um, I was trying to look this up on Facebook because I posted some pictures um, of you working with her. And it was just amazing because you just did a couple little adjustments with her, just adjusted, you know, her head and just, you know, and it was amazing because the, the look on her face that just suddenly changed. Yes. Like all of a sudden there was this like, and a smile, this huge smile. And I got these really great images of that because it was just like, oh my gosh, it was like magic. Yeah. And it's not magic, but it's amazing when you make the tiniest little adjustment to how you're coordinating or how you're, you know, how you're holding your body. And it, it's just like, you can see it on their faces and you can see it in how they're moving. And I just love that. That was just such a, a fun thing to watch and experience just sort of secondhand. Yeah. And that's why I love this work so much. It just, it dramatically changed my life and made me feel better. Like when I went to my first Alexander lesson, I was so pulled down in myself. I mean, you wouldn't recognize me if you saw a picture. My Alexander teacher said, and he told me that after the fact, he said, you, you were the heaviest student I've ever had. And not in terms of, of weight, I was quite slim at the time, but in terms of my, I was so pulled down in myself. And over the course of time, I, I, I like the metaphor of coming home. They were coming home to our true self, who we really are, how we're designed, how we're born, how we're built. And when you, when you come back home, there is that feeling of, ah, oh, and relief. And oh, this is how good it can feel to be a human being. And I, my, one of my mentors, Jeremy, he says, you know, if you want to take um, or add 10 years, you don't want to take 10 years off your life. If you want to add, add a decade to your life, learn the Alexander technique. And he's kind of kidding, but not really. And, and I've seen it in so many students and myself that it's like, they, they, they just look different. They look younger. It's like an anti-aging technique that's so natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're, you're not fighting against your body anymore. Yes, yes. Definitely. Yeah, I would, um, I'm one of those heavy people. <laughs> I'm one of those people, who, again, I just, 
I'm scrunched. I'm, and I know it, I'm aware of it. And I do use, you know, the constructive rest, um, the semi supine position and stuff. And that helps tremendously if I'm doing it on a regular basis. But yeah, I mean, I would, I wish that you weren't based out of Germany, right? Yeah. <laughs> Although you've been in the U S for a few months now traveling yeah. around and doing workshops and things. Um, yeah. you know, I would love to be able to work with you. At some point. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the th cool things, Karen, and, and thanks for saying that, but is that, um, a lot of times I'll work with the student and they'll say, oh, thank you for doing that to me. And I'll say, I didn't do anything, right? I just tapped into your innate wisdom and intelligence that you have in your body. And that's my ultimate goal with any student. I don't want to make them dependent on me and my hands and what I do. I want to give them tools, thinking tools that they can use to do this for themselves, for themselves. And so, um, you know, we think of like, our, our body is this thing, but actually what controls the body is the mind, right? And, and so it, it's all coming through the mind and our thinking. And so what's, what's really cool is, I love that you said that, because you can just notice, okay, I'm, I'm being heavy on myself, or I'm having these stressful thoughts, or I'm overwhelmed, or going through something difficult in life, or whatever it is, and you notice that that actually translates into your body. You feel it. You feel your thinking in your body. <laughs> you know? and, and if you if you if you just notice that, like, oh my my gosh, my thinking is so whatever, and your body will tell you the quality of your thinking, which is what a great design. Like, who thought of that? That's pretty cool. And then it's like, okay, I don't have to. I don't have to really like go in there and change my body. It's just I'm. Let's look at how I'm thinking. We have a phrase in Alexander: what you think is what you get and if i'm singing along and there's a high note coming up and i think oh no i'm gonna mess this up that's what i'm gonna get <laughs> yeah yeah and you brace yourself for it exactly and you're stiff and you're holding those tensions and yeah exactly yeah so that this can be a really uh, cool practical thing that people can do is just to kind of put a part of your tension part of your attention on what am I thinking about? What is the quality of my thinking? Like, what am I actually thinking about when I'm singing? Is it like toxic judgments about how I sound? Because like we said, those, you will feel those thoughts in your body. Or is it like, oh, this is the best I can do. And I'm really enjoying my sound. And you know, this is really beautiful music and all those really kind, helpful thoughts, then you're going to have a different experience in your body. Yeah, you had a great blog post this past week on um, some of the, the killers when it comes to practicing and what, what makes it difficult for us to actually, you know, practice well or get a lot of our practice. Yeah, and, it, and a lot of it... Those patterns, those thinking... Yeah, those patterns, and a lot of it just it comes from fear. It comes from, like, a fear that I'm not enough or I'm not good enough. We, we compare ourselves to other singers. It's all that stuff, and I know everyone knows what I'm talking about that's a human being that sings. It's all the stuff we deal with. Um, but the cool thing is we have a free mind that, ha that can make choices. And we can choose. I, I don't want to choose those or think those thoughts because those aren't helpful for me. And then we can look at what are some more constructive ways I can think that are going to actually support me. And for me, those, those thoughts that help you, they come from a place of love and kindness. And it's, it's one of the most natural things to do. It's what children do before they get into adults and get all caught up in their thinking and their ideas about themselves. And before but, the world like, really gets their hands on them. Yeah, but the, the children are free. And what's fascinating, children are curious, they're playful, they learn quickly, they're physically free. I think all those things are related. Yeah, so I think children are the best teacher, Alexander teachers in the world if you just observe them before mm -hmm. they've been sitting in chairs all day and, you know, kind of, like you said, beaten down by the world. Yeah. <laughs> are you familiar with uh, Mabel Ellsworth Todd's uh, The Thinking Body? It's not Alexander, mm -hmm. but it was, um, it was actually what led me down the little rabbit trail to finding the Alexander technique. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's very compatible with the, the Alexander concepts. It's amazing, but it was so highly influential. And it's basically, it, it, it basically emphasizes the same kinds of ideas that we have a natural design and we need to work with that design, not against it. 
Um, but it is, you know, there was a lot of like mapping to some extent, we'll call it mapping, um, you know, talking about this is actually how the structure is designed and how it, how it's shaped and, and how it's, you know, how everything goes into it. It's, it there's a lot of anatomy and physiology in it. Um, and just talking about, you know, just, yeah, finding, finding that, um, that use of ourselves that existed before we started interfering, before we yeah. started, you know, trying to take command, take control of our bodies. And it's, it was so influential for me. It just like got me really, really thinking a lot about things. And again, that's what, that's what got me kind of learning a little bit about Alexander. And I started buying some books on Alexander. I'm not a certified practitioner, but um, it's amazing just even in my own life, when I'm really starting to, when I'm focusing on those concepts, when I'm applying them to my life, it's amazing how things feel so much different. Um, they just feel different from day to day, um, but also in your singing. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I'm so glad, like everything you mentioned, I was like, preach girl, like, <laughs> yes, all of that. And <laughs> I, I wanna mention this, cause I, I touched on it at the beginning, but that the coolest thing about this is because our body is our instrument and we take our body wherever we go, we can always be practicing. Like I can go up for a walk and really kind of explore how things move and how everything's organized and find more freedom in my body. And then when I go to practice, it's easier. Like how cool is that? That my practice doesn't have to be limited to the practice room. It can be my whole life is now my practice room. Absolutely. So I attended one of your online workshops last summer. I think it was July. I think it was July you had it. Um, and it was a lot of fun because you had us doing some really practical, fun experiments. Um, you know, the dinosaur tail and the, the sad puppy tail and such and yeah. exploring different ways of positioning the pelvis and how that impacts, directly impacts the voice. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun because you had us, you know, um, tipping the pelvis anteriorly, tipping it posteriorly, and now try singing try try vocalizing with that and it was amazing we'd all report back I'm like oh my gosh I could feel tensions here I could feel it was so hard for me to sing those notes and yeah. um and those were exaggerated positions yeah. of the pelvis for example and you know even the feet we talked about kind of you had us leaning forward and leaning back and feeling you know how how we connect with our breath and how when we were out of balance you know it made it so much more difficult and then the tensions would just creep up all the way into the neck, into the larynx. Yeah. Um, and just, I think, exploring that and just playing around with yeah, different ways of, of balancing our bodies or imbalancing our bodies um, and how it directly impacts our singing, I think, is one of those experiments that we can, we can do just on our own. I don't know if you want to touch on any of that and kind of, I know I've just given a little hint of what you talked about. But. Yeah, well, let me share this, actually. I, I learned this. I want to give credit where credit is due. I learned this from um, one of our faculty members, Molly Kittle, who learned it from her teacher, Robin Avalon, who's a, a wonderful Alexander teacher. And she has some really cool, creative ideas um, about, about the body. She's got a whole course called Living in a Body, I think it's called. So check out Robin Avalon stuff. And Molly, too. She's great. Um, but so... Um, basically you can all try this where you, you take, you imagine you have a tail. Okay. And the first tail you're going to do is this, um, the sad puppy or the bad dog tail where you kind of tuck it. Yeah. You tuck it between your, between your legs there. Now I find that if you look around and most of the people in the world these days, because of devices that most people are in a kind of a sad dog tail, right? They're looking at their phone and they've got the sad dog tail going on. And also I've, I've discovered that a lot of people that have, um, how do I say this, ideas about their behind that, that they want to um, hide from the world, then they also tuck, <laughs> you know? So you can just experiment with, okay, sad dog tail and just sing and just notice what that feels like. And then you can go to a duck tail. You all know what a duck tail is, right? Where you're swinging way up there and that really exaggerates this curve in your lumbar because your your tail is connected to your um, spine it actually is part of your spine okay and then you can uh, try to sing and you, you'll notice what happens to my sternum when i go into ducktail my sternum goes up and i see this in a lot of singers that they'll come in they'll just be talking to me naturally and then they'll go they'll get ready to sing and they'll go 
<laughs> and their sternum will go whoop, like this big shield in front of them. <laughs> so you could notice how that's it's connected the front of you to what you do with your tail. And then just find neutral tail, just like dinosaur tail. Swinging back there, you can even like take it for a little walk. So you can notice the, the, the angle of your pelvis can really determine everything, both above it and below it. So that's just one idea. Um, I'll give everyone kind of two practical ideas that can really um, help, and I'm just gonna change the angle of my camera so you can see it. The first thing is, we talked about the behind, and you'll notice I call it a behind and not a bottom. A lot of people, they're trying to make this part of them a bottom, and then they go into sad dog tail, and then everything gets compressed and pulled down. Okay? But this is actually meant to be behind you. And the pelvic diaphragm, if you, if you look this up um, in like an anatomical model, you can see this, that the pelvic diaphragm is actually behind you when you stand, when you're standing. Okay, so I like to think, let my behind be behind me, which for some people feels like this, like it's way out there. <laughs> the second thing, which can be really interesting to observe, is if you put a hand at the front of your ribs and the front of your pelvis, to look at that relationship. Now watch what happens when I do the different tails. If I do sad dog tail, you'll notice my ribs come back and my pelvis goes forward. If I do duck tail, now if I find natural tail, if I find the natural design, what's fascinating is that the ribs are meant to hang a little bit over in front of the pelvis. So they're actually more forward of the pelvis. And again, because of devices, most people have it the opposite way. Yeah. So it's not, a, again, it's not a position. We're just kind of finding what is that natural design. I like to think in terms of neighborhoods, okay? So this is a neighborhood and this is a neighborhood. And this neighborhood is designed just to be a little bit in front of this neighborhood. <laughs> but it's not like, okay, got it. It's, you know, we're not looking for that. So those are a couple just kind of practical things you can use. Encourage people to use mirrors and video cameras to really see what's going on in yourself. Because we oftentimes don't get an accurate report from our body. It doesn't always tell us the truth. We think, like I, I used the example earlier of that woman I was working with. She really thought that she was totally upright. But in fact, we could all see it, she was leaning back. And then because that was her normal, when she was upright, it felt like she was leaning forward. <laughs> yeah, our bodies do tend to lie to us, I think, because we do, we have inaccurate proprioception to begin with. Um, but over time, as we, our bodies have an incredible ability to adapt and not always in a productive way. They just adapt to the poor alignment. And then, yeah, when we, when we, find ourselves the way that our bodies are designed to be, it just doesn't feel right anymore because our brains, our nerves are not telling us, they're telling us that they're wrong now. So we have to learn to be able to find, to go back in time almost and to find that, that place where our bodies actually want us to be. Yeah, yeah. Can, can I share one more thing? Because I, I would be remiss if I didn't share this really important piece of anatomical information because this is, this is kind of the crux of the Alexander Technique. And that's, that's the head spine relationship. Um, it, it, whoever's watching this, just take a moment and just kind of reflect, where do I believe my head sits on my spine? You can just kind of imagine that. And I do this in workshops and some people are here, some people they think here, but what's crazy is the truth is that your spine goes all the way up behind your mouth, behind your soft palate, up at the level of your ears. So this is actually the top of your spine. And in between your ears is what's called the occipital joint. And that's where your skull rests on the top of your spine. It's very high up. And so this is actually the bottom of your head. And your jaw is designed to move independent of your skull. Right? So this is your face, but this is not your head. Your head, at the bottom is here. And a lot of singers believe they have an upper and lower jaw. And so they, I call it Pez head. <laughs> You remember the Pez dispensers? To open their mouth, they tip, they tip their head back. And this is the thing that Alexander discovered was getting in the way of his vocal fatigue. That was causing his vocal fatigue. Is he would pull back, depress his larynx, gasp for breath. Yeah. 
So just understanding that this is designed to go this way, the jaw move, moves independently can, can help tremendously. Good. So tell us how we can get in touch with you and how we can learn about your workshops and, um, and everything that you have. To offer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have a website called totalvocalfreedom.com. And if you go there, um, you'll, you'll find our blog, which has a lot of really great articles and information. Um, you also learn about our programs. We do online programs. And we're also doing more and more um, in-person events. So we do one-day workshops. We do weekend trainings. Um, this past summer, we started doing uh, five-day retreats. Uh, we just finished one in Virginia a couple of days ago. And those are a blast, too. So. Um, if you want to contact me directly, my email is peter at totalvocalfreedom.com. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So that's exciting. Thank you so much. This has been Thank fun. You. Love this. Love talking about yeah. this stuff. Yeah. I can tell you're passionate. It's so cool to talk to someone that, um, that really gets it. Like I can see you get that this is, uh, this is how it works. And, and I'm so passionate to share this with singers because this is often the missing link. Like they have really good musical skills. They have really good technical skills, but their body is getting in the way of what they're trying to do. And once they get that freedom, it's like everything lines up and it does seem like magic. It's really cool. Yeah. yeah. And again, I, I witnessed a little bit of that magic and it was just like <laughs> so amazing to watch the transformation, like just instant when things are just lining up the way they should be. So yeah, it's so exciting. I hope cool. um, everyone will explore the Alexander technique a little bit and, and really just get a feel for what it can do for their singing in their lives yeah. in general. Yeah. Awesome. Good. Cool. So thank right. you. Thank you, Karen, so much. Thanks, everyone, for watching. <laughs>